Uh, I'm really surprised if I was here to look at compliance. To be honest with you, I expected like three people. So thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. This is, I'm going to try to make this as hands-on as possible. Uh, it's a lot. It's really hard to cover in 30 minutes. Um, but I really want to cover the 30,000 foot overview of the CMMC because it's something that's coming down. Especially if your company has like FCI contracts or you handle CUI data. So let's jump into it. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm a cybersecurity engineer, uh, primarily focused on cyber defense. Uh, I do a lot of incident response for my organization, and I'm diving into the wonderful world of application security. And that is a lot of fun. I do serve part-time the Air National Guard, so I am pretty familiar with some of these compliance profiles that are coming down. And more recently, I've been helping out DMC and MC assessments, both level one and level two, uh, for gap analysis to help some of these companies try to meet that level one, level two certification. And jumping into it, uh, I've learned a lot of things, and that's why I want to share this with you all, because I think it's very, very interested. But what the heck is a CM MMC? Is it a car? Absolutely not. It is a security framework set put together by the Department of Defense. Um, they, it is a certification that you obtain if you're handling FCI or CUI data. So you have federal contact, contract information if you're doing business with the government. We provided any type of quotes. Uh, they took the CMC certification and they're basing that mostly off NIST 171. And we'll cover the different levels, but they're going to be wrapping in NIST 172 uh, into the level three framework. But if you handle type of type of FCI or CUI data, uh, you will need to be CNMC certified depending on what level you're going after. And we got two levels, uh, two versions of it actually. So the old version 1.0 used to be five different levels you had to meet and it was really complex. And then now the newest CMC 2.0 is three levels. And I frankly like this a lot better. It's a lot more clean, it's a lot more condensed. And they have really a straight guide to follow depending on what level of certification you're going after. And so with NIST 171, you have 110 requirements that you have to meet in order to get that level two certification. But if you're going to go for level three, which I want to make a note on level three, it's not currently released or approved yet. They're actually working on the level three certification right now. So if you're trying to go for the highest level certification of the CMMC model, level three is not going to be it until it's finalized within a couple of years. And I don't even then, I don't know if level three is going to be available. But they take NIST 171, they take this framework and they they carve car it out of three different levels. And the two very key parts, depending on what kind of certification you're going after, whether it's a level one or level two, depends on these two items <coughs> right here. Does your company organization only handle FCI data? You're probably going to be a level one, go after level one certification. If it's CUI data, then you're going to go after level two. If you want my opinion, I would just go after a level two and call it good. Level one's great, uh, it's cheap, you do a self assessment. But level two is going to cover all of your bases. Again, for level ones, FCI data only. Government contracts, uh, emails, any type of communication you have with the Department of Defense, uh, they want you to be level one certified. If you're handling FCI and CUI data, they want you to meet a certain level of stricter security controls based on the NIST 171. And then again, level three, this is going to be your advanced protection. So when level three comes out, it's probably going to be more of your classified data. Um, so like Boeing's working with uh, the government on some classified data. They're going to have more stringent security controls in place for level three. <laughs> it's going to be easier to give you guys examples. So we know FCI data, uh, we don't want it to intend for publicly release. Is there national security concerns that is posed to public? There is, but it carries a less risk than CUI data. Now, CUI data is actually going to be more riskier and damaging to national security if it isn't released publicly, either on purpose, by threat actor, by accident. And so with that, it's good to understand what constitutes FCI and what constitutes CUI. Your FCI data, there's just quotes, contracts that you have with the government. Could be an internal email. If you're working with uh, a commander of a base, you're emailing him, that's going to be FCI data. Any type of manuals that your company or yourself that you write for these, uh, for your product or service that you're selling to the government, to the DOD specifically, uh, that will be considered FCI. And then any type of payment information to the payee and the amount uh, in tie to the tied to these government contracts are considered FCI. But one thing I found really interesting is that meeting schedules and participants. So you're probably thinking, hey, does my Google Calendar meet uh, with some military professionals? 
uh, count as FCI? More than likely, it probably does. And then, so we look at CUI, again, this is more the stuff that has a better risk or higher risk to national security. And so if you look at CUI, the specific blueprints and drawings of the service or product or military base. So if you work construction and you are building walls for a military base, that's going to be considered CUI data. Uh, same thing with uh, any type of software or service that you're selling, the DOD or a government entity, the actual source code is going to be CUI data. Uh, any type of PII within those negotiations or contracts are going to be considered uh, CUI data. And then any type of legal documents, agreements, or any type of contractual agreements that are marked CUI will become CUI. And working in the government and the military part-time, this could just be uh, an FCI document here, but if you see a document marked CUI at the top and at the bottom of a document, that is automatically CUI data. It doesn't matter what's in here. Uh, it could be a meme of a cat. It could be an address of a military base, which that's public as well. That will be CUI data. So you need to follow that CUI data security controls. Um, does that mean you need to change the level of certification? Not necessarily. There is some forgiveness there, but this is why I keep preaching. Just go after a level two certification in case you run into this. So if you see those two markings, make sure you handle that uh, very securely. So you, you're transferring that uh, using encryption. Uh, you're making sure that it cannot be, there's a risk of being publicly exposed. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that you can do, but that's very important because a lot of people in the military do violate that, that policy there. So we have an overview of the CMMC. Uh, what is NIST, NIST 171 and what does it really contain? Uh, this is Edward Norton for Fight Club. If you have insomnia or sleep issues, read NIST 171 and that'll cure it. You guys can quote me on that. <laughs> cure insomnia is reading NIST 171. But uh, outside of being funny, this gives you a framework. It's really, it's called protecting uh, control and classified information in non-federal systems organizations. So that means they're providing you security controls and a framework and how you can protect that FCI data. So that doesn't mean within the government itself, you know, if you're working on a military base, they're going to follow this 171. It's your company organization handling FCI or CUI data or a combination of both. And they give you these security controls that you can put in place to transfer to secure that data. And that is the main goal of NIST 171. And that is broken down out of 110 security requirements into 14 different families. The biggest one out of all the controls is access control. And if I was building a policy or a procedure around this, that's what I would really focus on. Because there's 22 different controls within the access control, and this is gonna be who is accessing the FCI or CUI data, who is reading and or executing the FCI or CUI data, what kind of service accounts have access to it, what kind of domain accounts have access to it. And so this is actually spread out across the entire framework and they're broken up into different types of controls. But the most that you're gonna find that have the most number of controls is within that access control. And then uh, going through these 14 different families, not touching on all of them, but it's just your general cybersecurity hygiene and framework. And so if you're already doing the basics and you're, do, you're doing pretty well. So if you have segmented networks for sensitive areas, if you have uh, encryption at transit and at rest. If you have um, RMAC policies and PAM policies already in place, I, I would be shocked that if you would be the majority of these. And then the last two, just it's response and personnel security. But the reason why this is so important, and I want to touch on both NIST 171 and CMFC is because uh, it's coming towards public institutions, not just government, Department of Defense contractors, but they're looking at applying this to public institutions. So not outside of education, I just grabbed this article. They're looking to apply the CMMC framework to public institutions by October 1st, 2025. Um, that date's still, they're still trying to figure that out because they received some pushback. I've heard 2026 might be the extended date, but they wanted to apply this framework because uh, cybersecurity is such a huge issue right now. I don't know if you guys, anybody watches the news, but there's a lot of attacks happening against the infrastructure. There's a lot of attacks happening against public institutions. There's attacks happening against county collectors. And so 
They want to push this basic hygiene framework down to these organizations to help protect against that. Is that going to defeat all attacks? Absolutely not. But it's going to help for some of these attacks that are just basic. So this is coming down the pipeline. Um, it's one of the things that companies are kind of pushing off until the very last moment. Again, there's different talks of, this one says 2025. But then I've seen other dates in 2026. It's the government. It'll probably change uh, in tomorrow or three hours. But this could, I would say 2026, your company needs to be, if you're seeking to do business or do contracts with the government or you're going to handle this data, you would get certified by the 2025 date. And I would stress that, you know, appropriately. 2026, I don't see that happening. It's probably going to be finalized by then. The final call outs and rules will be approved. And they'll say, just go ahead and implement it or you're going to lose. And if your company is interested, you know, right now, this might be them doing federal contracts and celebrating, but if you don't meet that level or that CMMC assessment, this could be you. And as you guys know, these are chat GPT, but I want to stress that some companies are really pushing this off and they're going to lose out on revenue. And if we work in cybersecurity, we work for companies, you know, revenue is probably the number one thing on your CEO or CFO's mind. And so... Uh, losing that certification, losing these government contracts could have implications to your organization. And I want to create, throw some other generated pictures on here. So I want to niche shaking hands with the CMMC. And I don't know why Chad GPT has a scientist <laughs> shaking hands with the knight. I was absolutely just didn't know what that was. I said, okay, so I need who is NIST and who is CMMC. So Chad GPT gave me a scientist shaking hands with a soldier. I guess NIST is the scientist and CMMC is the soldier. I have no clue why. So uh, use chat GPT with your, your own risk. <laughs> cool. So we got CMMC. We got NIST. Um, oh, we want to go after a certification. Well, the very first step, whether you're seeking level one or okay. level two, is that you have to audit your own network and you need to gather your own data. So your network diagrams, all of your policies, encryption policy, IT security policy, onboarding policy, offboarding policy, password policy, data classification policies. Uh, you need to look at all of your hardware devices that will be accessing this protected network. So you have to gather all this information, or this is pretty important here. If you guys use a managed service provider, I know they're MSSP, so Managed Security Solutions Provider. Um, they will need to provide all this for you if they do manage your network. But this is one of the things that you need to gather all of your data first before you can start the process, because it'll make your life a lot easier rather than trying to find and hunt for this information. And then you need to know what your data, data classification rules are. So when you're handling FCI and CUI data, you know, where is that going to sit? Uh, how is that going to be protected? So again, segmented FCI or CUI data, how is it protected through encryption at rest and at transit? Uh, what AD users, what devices, what hardware devices, what service accounts will be accessing this data? All that needs to be documented. So when you have all that information, you can choose the level that you want to go after. Again, if you're handling just FCI data alone, you can go after level one. The, the assessment process is really easy. And if you're doing the basic hygiene, cyber basic hygiene, you're probably going to beat it. Um, I did do one assessment. They had a negative score, so they did not meet that basic cyber hygiene. But this is what was a really small mom and pop shop. And then the owner and operator was also the IT director. So it, it, it's a tough life, but on the same hand, like, it's one of the things that you have to work towards. If you're looking for CMC level two, uh, again, more stringent requirements. And the two families of frameworks that were not required in CMC level one are required in level two. And then level three, again, it's still in review. We don't know a lot about it. But depending on which one you want to go after, this is the typical process of the data gathering. So this is a spreadsheet that I use to analyze and these are four more level ones, but you need to know your company name, uh, the documents you're going to be creating. So you're taking all this information and you're going to be creating security policies. And those security policies are going to match to that NIST 171. So you need to know company name. You need to know your CEO, your CFO. You need to know your head of HR. Um, who will be managing all these systems? Your IT directors. Who will be responsible for re revising these policies? Typically your ISOs or your CISOs. And then alongside that, when you're planning all this in the network and segmenting the FCI or CUI data, this is pretty important over here. 
So you need to know all your external service providers. How are you transmitting your emails and communications to these government officials? You need to know your compliance policies, your boundary protections. So again, your firewalls, whether it be a Fortinet, Cloudflare, whatever it is. Uh, what kind of public access and separation you have. So you're a segmented network that's going to be handling this data. And then all this right here is all your annexes. So you're going to be attaching to all of your service accounts. Everybody has access to the FCI or CUI data. All the hardware that touches your FCI and CUI data, all your mobile devices, uh, all your physical access devices attached to all of these documents. And there's a couple, there's a, there's a couple of tricks you can do here. But you need to gather all of that information, put those in a spreadsheet, put them on a document, and then you're going to have to attach those to those policies. And then for those who don't know a cage code, that's just a unique code they assign you. So when you're doing DOD contracts, they give you a number that you put in, but you'll need to know that as well. Okay, so we take this information and we're creating our policies. And this is just a template of what these policies are. So typically it's a company logo with your company name and then we're meeting the NIST 171 control right here. And then your document version, if this is your first time doing it, obviously it's gonna be one and then the release date of when this is made uh, public to your internal organization. And so between your data gathering process, you need to know the roles or responsibilities of each user. You'll throw those into, the, into a table within this document. So your executive leadership typically will approve and support the policy. Uh, your CIO, they develop the policy and they will implement it. And then the enforcers, the CISO, will come in and enforce those policies. And then it's up to the users to actually report on those policies if there's violations that are detected. And that's typical in every access control document that you have. And so going further into it, and this is where you need to map those security controls to NIST 171. So this is a guide over here just to tell you what privilege accounts you need to gather for those annexes. But this is where you're going to map the external connections to that access control and the L1 is for level one. So if you look up the NIST 171 guide, if you look up that security control, that's where you'll take that information of all your data gathering process. And then you'll map out how you're protecting and what external connections will be on that FCI or CUI data. Your annex should look like this for your hardware list and mobile devices. So what is the unique identifier to the switch, to the router, to the firewalls, all of the devices that are protecting that FCI and CUI data, that will need to be listed in one of your annexes. Looking at another policy that we typically use, so this would be your identification and authentication policy. So how are you authenticating users, making sure who they are, who they say they are, Again, you'll be taking all the roles and responsibilities and applying them to that same document. We're uh, creating a revision number, revision one, and anytime you update that policy, that will need to be updated. But then we get into mapping all the controls uh, from NIST. And so you'll need to list all of your user accounts and processes. So all the user accounts, uh, both standard users, how the cadence it is, so typically it's like first name, not last name, organization, what cadences or the naming convention for your privileged users, for your administrators, all that will need to be documented in all of the policies that you create to go after the certification. And then you'll need to list your authentication policy, typically that's your password policy, or if you use like certificate-based certificate -based authentication, that will be listed in this block here. And then all of your uh, applicable policies to this, so this could be your physical password policy attached to this document, and those are all attached right there. So what I tend to do and what I've seen in the past is that you'll attach just all of your relevant IT policies to that last page there. And the auditors seem to like that. <laughs> so, and again, this is, see, this is the biggest thing because a lot of companies and a lot of organizations that I work with don't have a lot of this inventory stuff, but if you are a mature organization, you may have this but you'll need to attach all your annexes to these documents as well. Um, oh, yeah, the trick. The trick here is, is that you can take that little line and just say, please see list of IT manager's office. And if you don't like the IT manager, then he'll like, get a bunch of auditors to his door and we all win. <laughs> but, but you can actually just change that and have these lists printed off somewhere in a locked drawer. Uh, I think uh, a GSA save is what they recommend, but... If you, if you put it behind a drawer and a lock and key, or if you have a knock, you can just throw it in there and make sure it's not being seen through a window or anything. But you can just change that, and that should be good for the auditors. 
So we create the policies, we audit our own environment. Uh, all of your weaknesses, all the stuff that has been missed will go in this, it's called OAM, and that's a plan of action, a milestone worksheet. Um, this is where you'll know, so let's say you don't have a segmented network for SCI data. You will note that, please, please do that, because that's not a good thing, you need to have segmented network. But you will identify that, and then you'll also assign a value to it. So all of these weaknesses have some sort of value, I think it's like, one to five, and if you don't have a segmented network for SCI data, uh, you will receive a five. And so you list all your weaknesses, uh, you you add, you add in the control, and then you have uh, who's going to be the system owner to actually fix these weaknesses. So could be you, could be your IT manager, could be the security department. Uh, you need a scheduled date, an identified date, uh, when you plan to actually fix all of these weaknesses. And then you also need a date when it's actually completed. So if you don't have a, a centralized patching server for your you know, devices accessing some of this stuff, and then you went ahead and got like a SCCM in place, uh, you will note that date when that was fixed and then you mark that off with OAM. But essentially you will go ahead and self-assess and add up all of your points in this column here, and then you'll take that final number and then you'll subtract that from once in, and that'll be your SR, SRPR score that you submit for your assessments. And then down here in this box, this is just your system security plan. Uh, again, this is some of those weaknesses you may have missed and they help you generate a score on that. Uh, but all that's pretty self-explanatory in the NIST 171. Okay, so we have our data. Uh, we built all of our security policies out. How do you get certified? I'll be honest with you, level one's actually super easy. I would be shocked if anybody reads a lot of these things. Uh, however, so you go through, you get your score, and then you go ahead and turn that into um, the DOD. DOD will typically will give you your certification, and now you can go after those FCI contracts. Uh, some key notes here is that uh, you want to have everything documented. So again, creating all those policies and mapping all those NIST controls to those uh, policies, you need to have some sort of digital copy or physical copy of those. Because anytime an auditor comes by and they want to audit this information, and let's just face it, it's the government, they can do what they want, essentially. Uh, you need to have this and be able to reproduce those. Does it happen a lot? I haven't necessarily seen it, but I'm sure it will happen once we get closer to that CMMC date. But essentially, uh, you'll go to uh, a website. It's level one. You'll go to a website, you'll submit your score, uh, you'll create all the proper accounts, and then once that gets approved, then you get your level one certification. Now, a level two, you need to do all the same things within a level one, but alongside that, you need to contract a third party, which is called a C3PAO. And so what they'll come in is they will audit your environment and see if you're gonna meet that level two certification. And so they do an entire gap analysis. You'll still need to do self-assessment to get your score, but then your C3PAO will actually have your official score. And once they're done with their audit of your network, they will grant you your certification and then you can get your level two. But if they don't grant you that, obviously you're not gonna get your level two certification. Um, again, if it were me, I would go after a level two just because it covers both FCUI and CUI data, even though you're not gonna handle um, CUI data, I think level two is probably a better process, but it also brings up your cyber hygiene a lot as well. So if you're looking for level one, uh, we did the self-assessment, we got our policies baked in, we have all of our information ready, we did the, we did the scoring system. So we're gonna take our SPRS score, then we're gonna submit it to the PIE. These acronyms are fun, right? It's all government acronyms. So any foreign military in here, anybody? Okay, acronyms, 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 you guys get it, great. But yeah, we're gonna take, submit that to the Procurement Integrated Enterprise Environment, and they will probably get back with you pretty quick. However, you can send your self, level one self-assessment score to the Navy, to some sort of random mailbox in the Navy. I would recommend doing that. You're probably never gonna hear from them again. So, but you'll need to submit your cage code, your SSP, your POAMs. You'll need to submit all of your policies and procedures, the total score. You need to send them everything throughout your level one assessment to that random mailbox. I wouldn't do it, but you know, I've seen crazier things. Again, level two, just going back to that, C3PAO is going to do your audit. They're going to submit the scores and then you'll do your certification. Level one, super simple. But uh, some of the things I want to communicate, communicate to you guys to look out for is that um, the final revision, I think they're going to include that your MSP that you're using is going to have to be certified for the level of certification that you're going after. 
So if you're going after a level one, uh, your MSP or MSSP is going to have to be a level one certified MSP. Uh, you'll no be able to longer use, you know, Fred's computing down the street because they're super cheap um, if he's not level one certified. The same thing with level two. You're seeking a level two certification. Your MSP or MSSP is going to have to be um, a, cert a level two certified shop. Uh, I would, now would be the time to actually uh, turn off all of your weak ciphers and TLS protocols that are no longer supported. Because as you do these audits or as you continue to do these assessments, uh, they're not going to approve any network that's going to say, hey, we still operate SSLV2. Um, and that's a terrible idea, so please don't do that. So make sure you turn those off and tell your customers that are supporting uh, those old protocols just to fix their stuff. I would use another word for that, but yeah, we've got kids in the room, so I don't want to say that word. <laughs> but uh, fix their stuff, uh, turn off those protocols, use modern ciphers, use modern encryption. Uh, also, uh, encrypt your hard drives. So any of those clients that are accessing the FCI or CUI data need to have like BitLocker or some sort of encryption on the hard drive. But most important out of all of this is that the False Claims Act, if you are going after a level one or a level two certification, anything that you say that you're doing and they come in and you're not doing, your organization or yourself can be held under the False Claims Act. Uh, we have seen that in the industry uh, and it seems to be going that way and I think it's probably gonna get more as the government can't make their debt payments. So they're gonna look for other sources of revenue. So please, 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 only put in those documents and policies, whether it's level one or level two, do it, or say what you're doing and how you're actually implementing these NIST 171 controls because uh, they will come after you for that under the false claims act. Resources, uh, there's really not anything better than outside of the NIST 171 or the CMMC documentation. Uh, they're both really good guys. Again, I was kind of joking around like it does put you to sleep, but that part is true. And they do put you to sleep, but they do give you a good guidance. And it's probably some of the better government documents that I've seen out there to give you the insights of the level one and level two scoping guidance. Cool, that was really quick. Uh, I think I'm within time, so. Yeah, yeah so well, this is Q&A. I'll open it up, there's my contact. But hey, we got, I saw you back there first. Can you go back to the previous uh, slide? Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Oh man, I didn't, I didn't expect any questions. Guys, yeah, okay. Whoa. All right, we'll go with you. No, I'll move my way then. Uh, so for small businesses going after DFD contracts, is there a size of business where it will be impractical to pass this? Do you need to be a certain minimum size in the schools? Any size, whether you're a one or 10 man shop. Uh, if, if you're going just FCI data, level one's simple to do. I say simple, it's not easy, but yeah, any size. Is that true of CUI as well? Yeah, same with CUI. Yep. Um, do you think that it's ever going to bleed into like other types of um, institutions like financial and all of that? Yes. Yep. Um, I haven't seen it. And I can't, so I can't point you to source like this is going to be it. No, but they're yeah. talking about like <laughs> county collectors and stuff, yeah. trying to implement some of the stuff on the local, at the local level as well. So, assess and authorize, but once they're actually approved, how often do contractors have to meet those requirements? Is it similar to what we do to you? Well, or it's pretty similar. Uh, level one, so you have to do an annual assessment, but if you, they don't see progress towards that 110 score, uh, they will like call you, like, hey, what's going on? On the level twos, I can't remember how many times the C3PAO assessed, but it's like a triennial. I can't remember, is that right? They think they do it three times a year to assess against your network just to make sure nothing has changed. Uh, but also in the level two, you have to do that three to four times a year assessment, but also your annual assessment on top of that. But um, level one is just another annual assessment. Yeah. So this, this 110 score where you subtract your findings, you have to find those you get your total score. Mm -hmm. And then you issue, uh, issue POAMs to correct these deficiencies. Yeah. Are you still CMMC yeah. qualified at that time? Because yeah. you haven't applied the POAM? Yeah, as long as you don't have like a negative score, like they're not going to be like, hey, you can't be level one certified. But if you get that same score in your next annual assessment, they're probably going to tell you, sorry, you're out of luck. Just you need to show progress that you're actually working towards full compliance. That's the biggest, so that's actually a good good question. Thank you for that. You see that 110 score, you don't have to meet that 110 strictly. They just want to see you work towards that 110 score. So if you get like a 25 um, and they're like, that's not good at score by the way. 
but you're working towards a 110 score in your next annual assessment, just as long as you're making progress, they're okay with keeping that level one certification. I'm going to go with him real quick, but I'll come back to you. Um, I have two questions. First one for you, maybe I was uh, privy to maybe as a myth that C3PO or say they were few and far between. Is that really not the case? Has that been the case for a very long time? So a good a good resource for a lot of the stuff is like cyberab.com uh, that'll list your C3PAOs. I I haven't seen that. It seems like there's a surplus of those guys out there, and they're reaching out. They're cold calling people about this. Uh, I'm not a C3PAO. Um, I haven't really necessarily worked with him closely. That's somebody else that I work with. But you know, they, they, he hasn't really had issues finding those people. The the second one I had, uh, maybe the first, was more along the lines of the small business question, right? Uh, for talking about CUI, for talking about that level two uh, need, that certification need. Um, it, it, it looks to me that there's going to be this divide of I can get there, but I'll never make that much revenue. Mm -hmm. And so now I just need to just stay in lane. Um, is there going to be an ability for any of those that traditionally do this type of work, but maybe just strictly doing to develop under a uh, more of a primary contractor, in a sense, <clears throat> to where they're using their level of clients, their, um, I don't know if that's in, in the way of the industry and talk, um, or is it more so get ready to spend it? Oh. oh, man, that's a good question. It, it's a little bit of both. Um, I would say for, you know, if you're if you're seeking a level two certification, the easiest way to get that is to move it to a cloud provider with a thin client background. Um, that might be a little bit upfront cost, but I know with these mom and pop shops, they're actually looking at these data centers that are providing the service, and they're matching. You know, because they act as an MSP, but they're matching like your number of assets or whatever. And sometimes it's a cost saved by doing that, just by moving to that data center. Um, you know, it's it's really hard to maintain, especially these smaller shops where you're the operator and owner and you're also the IT director. Like those people, I just tell them, if you can go find a data center that provides a service, that's probably the best way. Now it's gonna hurt in the short term, but the long term to continue your revenue model, that's probably the best bet for both people. You don't have Google. Yeah, go ahead. How much of a, of a significant effort would it be to go from, let's say, SOC 2 or ISO 27001 to level 2 COMC? It's completely different. It's the government. They complicate things. Now, you're already meeting those compliance frameworks, so, or whoever, you know, your organization. You're probably good, but level 2, they're very, very stringent since it's dealing with that COI data on what controls you need to meet. Right. I know SOX is not going to meet every single control that NIST 171. Uh, or um, ISO 27001 is the same thing. So you, you definitely have to audit everything. You know, we've got to map each control to what this ones and ones are required for that level two. So thank you. I actually did not expect any questions. I expected everybody just to leave. So thank you for your time, guys. Round of applause. Thank you.